This is Normandy Ellis, and I'm recording Mary Beth Hathaway, Reverend Mary Beth Hathaway, for the uh, Friends of Camp Chesterfield uh, memory uh, recordings. And this is March the 8th, 2017. And Mary Beth, thank you for agreeing to do this with us. It's my pleasure. All right, so can you tell us a little bit, first of all, um, just give me your uh, basic history, where you came from, um, and um, what you do here at Camp Chesterfield now. All right. Uh, I hail from Fort Worth, Texas. Lived there. Thought I would live there all my life. Uh, I was a trans medium. I did uh, guided meditations and uh, did a development class in Texas. And, but I was traveling here to study four times a year, 1,033 miles each way. And then one day, I had just been back from two weeks up here. I was exhausted, but God kept telling me, I need you to do something for me. So I told my cousin to go on into town and that I had to meditate. And I prayed and I meditated for two hours. And when she came home, I was loading my stuff in the car. <laughs> and she said, are you just nuts? What do you think you're doing? You're exhausted. You're broke. And I said, I don't care. God told me to go to Indiana. I'm back in my car. So she still keeps on ragging on me while I pack the car. And finally, she said, this is ridiculous. Not only are you tired, you don't have any money. I counted it, and I said, I have $7, and God told me to go to Indiana. I'm going to Indiana. So I get in the car, and I travel the long driveway, and I decided to stop and check the mailbox at the end of the drive, and there was a check from one of my students that said, we think you need to do the firework. Here's the money to go to Indiana. Now, see, I left in full faith believing that God would provide when he tells me to do something. I had no idea there was a check in the mailbox. I had my $7, my car was loaded, I was headed for Chesterfield. So what did you find when you got here? Well, uh, I was here probably uh, two or three weeks, and so... Somehow or another, the money kept coming in while I was here, and I got it out, I counted it, and I said, God, I'm back down to my $7, what do you want me to do? And I said, you need to give me an answer, and I want it right now. So staying in the, the women's dorm then, I walked into the kitchen, sat down, and Delana, who was the hotel manager, uh, came in and sat down, and she said, my girl that comes for the summer can't come. Would you stay for the summer and take care of the Western Hotel? I said, okay, God, got the message. And uh, that was in 1997. I've been here ever since. All right, and so you stayed that summer? I stayed that summer. Uh, and then we went into winter, which I'd never had winter before and thought surely that I would die. Uh, but I had a friend that taught me all about layering, so I managed to make it through the, window, the winter. And uh, the following year, the hotel manager quit. We got another one for a year. Uh, she quit, and I was the last man standing. So they said, here's the keys. You're the hotel manager. Uh, it was the same week uh, that my daughter had sent me her child to raise. So I'm sitting there going, okay, it's my birthday. Happy birthday, Mary Beth. Here's two hotels to run and a small child to raise. But it all worked out. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> okay, so I have a couple of questions that are related to that. Okay. You managed two hotels. I Which did. were the two that you worked in? This one? It was the Western and the Sunflower. Okay. Uh, when I took over as hotel manager, the office was still in the Sunflower. Uh, for years, all registrations, all check-ins came through the Sunflower. But there were a couple of reasons I wasn't real happy about that. One of them was it's all wood and 
and I was getting allergies in there. The other, uh, although I had several spirit friends that lived in there, and they were all very kind, except the little redhead, who when I was trying to do my paperwork would sit, sit on the staircase and go, excuse me, don't you see these cobwebs on the stairs? Excuse me, and I couldn't get anything done. I'd have to stop and go get a dust rag and clean the stairway. So uh, life was a little hectic there, and then I moved the office back to the Western Hotel. So I ran back and forth for, oh, I guess eight years before they finally uh, closed the Sunflower. Right, and you lived at the Western. I lived at the Western. Uh, I lived in the women's dorm for the first year and shared the dorm with as many as 19 people sometimes. And then uh, when Barbara Loft got her house, uh, there's a little two-room apartment down there when she was living in. When she got her house, they gave me the little apartment, which I lived in there for, I don't know, 10 years. And... Um, and then I got my little house down the street. Okay. Now, the next thing I wanted to ask you about something you said was that you raised your grandson here. How was it raising a child here in this environment? You know, it was phenomenal. Uh, he got such a good start being raised as a spiritualist. And uh, he was very uh, clairvoyant. He was a good healer in his own right. And he saved me more times than I can count. Uh, one of which, there was a bus that pulled in here one time, and 40 people came pouring into the hotel and said, well, what are we supposed to do? Our event doesn't start till 10. And I'm standing there like a deer in the headlights, and here comes this little six-year-old child into the room and assesses the situation and says, come along, I'll take you all on a tour. <laughs> That's great. All right. So he as was a, so much help. As a tribute to your grandson, what's his name? His name is Christopher Sean McMillan. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, uh, like I said, he was very, very open and he loved to play with the little gnomes in the gnome garden. All except the one with the red eyes, which was mean. So I told him to stay away from that one. Okay. So, uh huh. Okay, um, so when you came here, you had already been working as a medium, but you also studied here, and I know that you participated in some of the student services and so on. Mm -hmm. Who was your most influential teacher? Uh, well, there's two really. My, the very first development teacher I had was Reverend Suzanne Greer, who was just the cream of the crop. Uh, she was the best medium I'd ever met, and when I was driving back and forth, uh, that would be, I couldn't wait to get here so I could get my appointment with Susie. And so, uh, you know, in Texas, I was a trans medium. I really didn't understand stand-up clairvoyance until I came to Chesterfield. Also, that's where I got my very strong base in spiritualism and in mediumship was at Chesterfield. And as far as developing my mediumship, Suzanne Greer, uh, she could take a pile of dirt and turn it into a good medium. She's just that good of a teacher. And so I stayed with her for many years as my development teacher. And then I fell in love with Reverend Shirley Srogi. She was the most phenomenal person I'd ever met in my life. Uh, so I was in her development class, and she was a taskmaster, let me tell you. Uh, she wouldn't give you time to meditate or tune in. It would go, do messages. And you would have to jump up and do them, which she always told us it was good training in case you're somewhere and all of a sudden you get drug up on the platform to always be ready. So she taught me so very much. Uh, she was so intelligent half the time I wasn't sure what she was talking about, but I did learn a lot from her and she ended up not only being my teacher, but one of my best friends and also uh, one of my clients as I took care of her in her declining uh, age. Yeah, that, that's wonderful. Um, she and Wynn were heading up the metaphysical program. Can you say a little bit about that? Well, I can say... Uh, when I first came here, we did not have a metaphysical program in 1994. 
And I got here, and I had been through a metaphysical school in Texas, and I came here and I thought, don't these people know anything about energy? Because nothing was really offered with the use of energy. And uh, I was very perplexed by the whole thing. Uh, as I have always seen energy, I came in that way. Uh, and people just didn't seem to get it. And so I was just absolutely thrilled when they put together this metaphysical program. Because it is synonymous, it goes hand in hand with spiritualism. Uh, there is no message work without some kind of energy. So it's really uh, a duality thing. And I was very impressed at the way they set it up. Reverend Winsrogi, uh, of course, was backed by Shirley for a long time after that. He just completely took over the metaphysical program. It's a huge success, and I just couldn't be happier that we now have that at Camp Chesterfield. Okay, great, wonderful. Um, and can you tell us a little bit more about how and in what ways your gifts developed? I know you do different things from the platform now. Can you talk a little bit about how those different gifts developed? Well, um, yes I can. Uh, I had always seen spirit as a child. Honey was my best friend and we would get in so much trouble when we were little because I, I, no one told me I didn't have to talk out loud to her. And uh, we would be getting loud and playing at night. And my mother would shout, Mary Lisbeth, shut up in there. So I really, but then working mainly with trance, uh, didn't focus so much on my guides. And so when I came here and began to study and realized that it was part of the process of building a good foundation was having a strong connection with each of your guides. And so the first time I came here, and I'll never forget it, I was laying on a bed in the dorm, and here comes this six-foot rabbit, drags up a chair, and says, can we talk? And I thought, great. My joy guide is a six-foot rabbit that sounds like Joan Rivers. So, <laughs> but actually, it was just a costume. She's not really a bunny. Uh, but she came in that way because her stage name is Honey Bunny. And so I really got to start making a connection with all of my guides here. One-on-one, mm -hmm. uh, -on -one, we started with the, the Joy Guide. Uh, my Indian, I got acquainted with him really well. And he had me go along the holy grounds of Camp Chesterfield and pick up this and pick up that. And I had a pile of this and that. So then I sat down and I said, you need to show me what to do with this. And so he said, go to XYZ store, uh, get this, that, and this, and then come back. And so I did. He had me get some particular beads that he wanted to use. And I sat down with him and we made a medicine shield on a piece of suede. And it's still hanging over my bed to this day. Wow. Wow, that's great. Um, so, tell us a little bit about one of the stories of someone who's come to the Western that you remember, or some, uh, maybe it was a guest medium, um, something very memorable that maybe you could share with us. Well, that's like narrowing it down to a needle in a haystack, but I'll, I'll try. Uh, just in the overall scheme of things, it has been such a blessing to watch these newbies come here, no training, no nothing, and watch them learn and grow in their mediumship, and then be have get papers, eventually be ordained, and move off and get their own church. That's been the biggest thrill of working here at all for me, is to watch them learn and grow. And there have been hundreds, maybe thousands, that this has happened. Uh, so, they're all, there's so many And of do them. some of them bring groups back with them? Some of them do. Uh, we had, uh, actually the Peacock Room that we're speaking from, uh, uh, belonged to Sigrid. And she would bring groups from Canada. Uh, we've had people come from Zimbabwe, from all over the world to study here. 
and uh, but uh, Reverend Segrin and Michelle, her husband, uh, who had the next room over, would come and they would bring large groups of people. Uh, I guess probably the one that's closest to me at all through all of this is Reverend Francis Dodick from Louisiana who was actually my medium. I, I had phone readings with her if I needed a reading. And uh, she was just the loveliest person ever. It was Frances and Howard. And she would come here and she's gone, she'd go through set after set of students and bring them all here. They would load up in vans and come 10, 12 people at a time from Baton Rouge to come here and study. And Reverend Frances was just the kindest person I ever met. The uh, last time she was here and I knew something was up because she'd go along on her little walker and every time she saw me she would stop and turn and say, Mary Beth, I love you. And then totter on off in her walker. So it was, we were terribly close. And Howard, her traveling partner, uh, was just one of the most phenomenal meetings, mediums I ever met. And he was very close with my grandson, Christopher. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, when they would gather their students in the lobby to do a, a meditation or a, a circle, they always included Christopher mm -hmm. because they said he was a, such a powerful energy to add to the group. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And do you still see visitors who have passed into spirit passing through these hallways? Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, of course I do. Um, Edith Shaw, uh, her room was the very front corner, 217. She came here for so many years and even brought her little grandchildren here. And I see her quite frequently, of course. Uh, Francis and Howard, I do see them quite a bit. And Sigrid is not in spirit as of yet, so. Good. But I do see uh, Reverend Peggy Hensley quite frequently. Mm -hmm. She wasn't, uh, she didn't live on the grounds, but she was very much a part of Kent Chesterfield. And in the book of the top 100 uh, psychics of the world. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about uh, how camp seems now compared to, you know, and then tell us a story of how it, it was in the days that you first came here. Yes. When I first started, my first seminary was in August of 1994, and uh, there were 184 students. Uh, we had to use the cathedral. The chapel wasn't large enough to handle it all. And uh, I guess what I remember the most about that is you had to be careful when you were scheduling your classes because the first time I had one in the cathedral, the next one was in the art gallery, and the third one was in the cathedral. So I made uh, very sure the next time I filled out my forms uh, to pay attention to location. Uh, but it was magnificent being in that... Uh, that glorious cathedral. It is just so beautiful and so powerful from years and years and years of mediums uh, on that platform. And we were still using it as I went uh, on up to my first set of papers. So I had the opportunity to work uh, from the platform of the, of the uh, cathedral. And uh, it was really amazing. There are five spotlights that come to the stage, so you really can't see anyone. So, but spirit would just light them up. If I was supposed to go to that person, they would light them up and they'd be the only person in the room I could see. Mm -hmm. So it was phenomenal working from that platform. And I truly do miss it. Yeah. Uh, today, now we, I noticed the attendance going down and down over the years. However, there have been a lot of centers that are opened up closer to where people live. Uh, and a lot of graduates that we had that started teaching. And so that was uh, all right uh, for them to go off and start their own groups. So I have noticed the attendance go down to where we had about 30 students per class for seminar. And now it's coming back up in the 40s and the 50s. and. Uh, 
it's it's like the camp is waking back up again. It's mm. very exciting to watch it grow back into what I perceived that it was before. Now I wish I could have been here a hundred years ago when you couldn't walk on the grounds. There were so many people and they had to do, way back then, uh, they had to do everything outside. So we had outdoor platforms and pr uh, places for them to give message work. Uh, their readings were all done at the toadstools. Uh, these little uh, concrete tables and each of the mediums had their name on there so they would go and sit in their spot and they would do the readings from the outside. Now it's a little bit before my time but I can still enjoy going to the toadstools and standing on these platforms that were built for the outdoor services. Right. Now I know you also worked in the healing service in the cathedral because I attended one of those services. Can you tell oh, me about that experience? I would love to. We had the most phenomenal Holy Spirit revivals in that cathedral. And we would have Bishop Howard Allman, which is the most learned and respected uh, teacher that I ever met. Uh, because of his credentials, he was allowed to to actually go and study the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm -hmm. So this man was so evolved, and he had the best choir you've ever heard in your life. And they would proceed in and come in there and lift the roof off the cathedral. And so that certainly uh, more than raised the energies for the revival and uh, for people being anointed in the Holy Spirit. And probably, uh, we, one of them, the last one that I can remember doing with Bishop's uh, choir, I think we had 325 people to attend. And so there was a very long uh, procession of healers that you would walk through, and there were five uh, healers ready at the front to handle the crowd. It was a phenomenal, uh, it, I didn't sit down probably for 24 hours because I was so supercharged over having all this energy. And then uh, I, our little choir was allowed to sing with the, his big choir at the last one, and it was just phenomenal. I don't know that any of us, that our feet touched the ground. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, the house that you live in now, because you've moved out of the Western, yes. and you have your own home. I do, and I love my little house. It's just awesome. And I was able to set up a healing sanctuary in there. Um, when I first came here, there was a medium who lived there, Reverend Emma Kruger. And she was actually the first one of the mediums I met. And it was quite, well, I don't want to use the term accidental, but I wasn't seeking her. I just was walking down the street, and she walked out to the street, grabbed both of my hands, and said, your head hurts, your feet are hot, and blah, 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 blah. It just took off with an impromptu reading, and all I could do was go, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and I just, oh, I just fell in love with this woman. She was, she was an old German woman, and she was, uh, well, she was in her own right a phenomenal medium. And so I would go quite often to visit with Miss Emma. And if she had a problem, she'd call me. And she was very abrupt, you know. She would say, I need you to come over. I want you to come right now. So <laughs> I would stop whatever I was doing and go and, you know, attend to her. And so she decided she would live to be 100 and that she wasn't going to leave until then, which she did not. It was the day after, or right after her 100th birthday that she just peacefully fell asleep. And so, it's still at that time, uh, I wasn't gung-ho to have a house. I was cozy in the basement of the Western, and, and uh, people go, well, how can you live in a basement? And I would tell them, wherever I am, God is, and it's just fine. But after Miss Emma passed, uh, my dear friend John Hudson bought the house. And he got in there and he worked and he worked and he redid all of the wood in the whole house. Put a new, new flooring in. He really got it all fixed up and gorgeous and then went out to work in the backyard and dropped dead. 
So, now all of a sudden I went, that's my house. I'm supposed to have that house. And I would move a mountain to get into that house, which I really didn't have to do. His family was extremely courteous and generous with me as far as getting the house. So I walked in a house that was move-in ready. I didn't have to do a thing. Wonder. Because Reverend John had done everything for me. So I've always looked at it, it's Miss Emma's house, and John moved in to get it ready for me. <laughs> okay, um, I have one more question that I want to ask you before we close out the interview, and thank mm -hmm. you for all of your detailed answers so far. It's really been helpful. Um, a lot of times when I go and speak with people, they ask me, how is spiritualism relevant to them today? Uh, how is it different from where, where we were before? How is it relevant to people in light of the internet and more access to uh, other types of readings? It, we are in an, an energy shift. And I know this is not new information. We are speeding up. And uh, I think back in the day, a hundred years ago, when the place was packed, that the people were just, oh, this is here, and didn't realize it. But as we progress and go into a higher vibrational energy, uh, those who are sort of trapped in fundamentalism and uh, look at the... Uh, letter of the law, not the spirit of the law, uh, they're not able to cope and to keep up. However, they are starting to awaken. Wait, wait, there's something more that I didn't know about before. And as they start to discover spiritualism, they realize that, first of all, it's still a God thing. It is a religion that incorporates all religions, but it also gives you an avenue toward retrieving the information that you need to keep up with today's society. And it's really so important that everyone wakes up and, and realize that they don't have to be suppressed uh, by only following what the Pope says or uh, whatever, uh, that all religions can become one because we truly are all one. And so that's really coming into the consciousness thinking of everyone in every uh, country and whatever religion. They're starting to wake up to the fact that we're all one and we better learn to deal with it. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. It's been my pleasure. Yes, I'll close this out now. <laughs>